Welcome to section 46 of bacteria. This is our bacteria overview figure. In this video, we'll be discussing treponema pallidum, which you can see right here. This is the organism responsible for syphilis. This scene will take place back during the time of lords, magic, goblins, hobbits, and powerful rings. The first character to the scene is this paladin warrior. Paladin sounds like treponema pallidum, so this hero, front and center, will be our symbol for this bug. Now notice that we've shown a spiral staircase coming down to this open area. Just like in our Borrelia burgdorferi video, the spiral staircase is in this image to help you remember that Treponema pallidum is a spirochete. Now notice that we've shown an evil-looking goblin that is trying to kill the paladin. However, the paladin is a warrior of light. So, you can see that he's beginning to fight this dark creature with a light magic spell. The light that's being shined on the creature is here to help you remember that dark field microscopy can identify Treponema pallidum. So, dark creature being destroyed by light for dark field microscopy. This is a dark field photomicrograph of Treponema pallidum. Notice that the organism is spiral shaped, which is why it's a spirochete. You can see that quite well, for example, right here. While this is important to remember for step one, you should know that dark field microscopy is not routinely used anymore because there are more other convenient ways of diagnosing this disease, which we'll discuss in a minute. Okay, let's continue discussing the image. Notice that the paladin has the letter S on his armor. We introduced this symbol in our Neisseria gonorrhea image, and it's in this image to help you remember that syphilis is a sexually transmitted infection. Also notice that we've shown the paladin holding a hammer. Hammer sounds like Herxheimer, so we've included this in the image to help you remember the Jerish Herxheimer reaction. This is a febrile reaction that may occur following treatment of syphilis. The mechanism is somewhat poorly understood, but it's thought that as the organism is destroyed, cytokines and lipoproteins are released and immune complexes form. If you look at the center of the hammer, you can see that we've added a skull. This is to help you remember that the jerish herxheimer reaction occurs following the destruction of organisms. Finally, notice that we've shown the hammer plated with copper pennies. Pennies is our symbol for penicillin, so this is here to help you remember that the symptoms associated with the jerish herxheimer reaction begin following treatment with penicillin. Okay, before we go any further, you should know that syphilis occurs in stages, known as primary, secondary, and tertiary syphilis. To help you compartmentalize this information, we've intentionally created the image with three levels. The first level, where the paladin is fighting the goblin, right here, will mostly represent information about primary syphilis. However, we'll also include some general information about the organism here as well, and this will mostly be between the first and second levels over here. The second level, right here, will represent information about secondary syphilis, and the third level, right here, will represent information about tertiary syphilis. Finally, we'll also include information about congenital syphilis on the far left side of the third floor, right here. So hopefully by remembering these three levels, you'll easily be able to compartmentalize the information in your mind. All right, notice that the dark goblin is attempting to destroy the paladin with a cane. However, the blow is clearly being blocked by the shield, which means the paladin is unharmed by the attempted attack. Cane sounds like shanker, and the fact that this is being blocked should help you remember that it's painless. So putting these two ideas together should help you remember that primary syphilis presents with a painless genital shanker. This is an image of a painless shanker on the shaft of the penis due to primary syphilis. Okay, now let's talk about screening and diagnosing syphilis. This can be a pretty confusing topic and is simultaneously one of the highest yield topics for you to be familiar with regarding syphilis. This is why I've included a slide here to help clear things up. After we cover the information and logically understand it, I'll return to the image and help you memorize the details. So there are two general categories of tests that are used to screen for and diagnose syphilis, non-treponemal tests and treponemal tests. There's some debate around this topic, but in general, the non-treponemal tests are considered screening tests, while the treponemal tests are considered confirmatory tests. There are many specific types of tests within these categories, but for step one, you really only need to know three because these are the most commonly used. Within the category of non-treponemal tests, you need to be familiar with the Venereal Disease Research Laboratory Test, or VDRL, and also the Rapid Plasma Reagent, or RPR test. Either of these tests can be used and are equivalent to one another. Both of them are based upon the detection of anti-cardiolipin antibodies. This is high yield, so remember this point. These are antibodies that form in response to lipids that are released following cell damage caused by treponema pallidum. However, a negative test does not rule out an infection because once the lipids are released, it may take up to four weeks to generate a robust immune response. So for example, if a patient presents with a painless shanker five days after becoming infected, they may test negative but still have an infection. So while non-treponemal tests are considered the screening test, they are relatively poor screening tests. This is why it's important to do a confirmatory test. The main confirmatory test you need to be familiar with is called the fluorescent treponemal antibody absorption test, 
or FTA-ABS test. This test is based upon the detection of antibodies directed against treponema pallidum antigens. There are many nuances about each test that are likely beyond the scope of step one, so just know that you should always perform both tests, a non-treponemal test and a treponemal test. Only if both tests are positive can you be certain that the patient has an active treponema pallidum infection. If this is confusing and you'd like to learn more, feel free to go to UpToDate or another reputable resource, and you can learn about all of the intricacies here. But the information on this slide should be sufficient for doing exceptionally well on step one. Finally, you should know that if a patient is presenting with neurological symptoms, then you should also test the CSF. Some resources can be overly confusing by saying that only certain tests should be used depending on the stage of syphilis, but this is nonsense. If a patient has syphilis, you will almost always do a non-treponemal test followed by a treponemal test. The only variation on this is that you should also test the CSF if you suspect neurosyphilis. But again, the process is the same here. You test the CSF with a non-treponemal test followed by a treponemal test. Some resources may say that PCR is used to test the CSF, but there is some debate around this topic, so just remember that you always do a non-treponemal test followed by a treponemal test. All right, with this in mind, let's help you memorize these details. Now you can see that we've added a few more characters to the scene. This nasty goblin right here was trying to capture the hobbit when an archer shot him right in the head with an arrow. We can now see the goblin falling to his death, and the hobbit has also fallen during all of the excitement. After all, hobbits are pretty clumsy creatures. We can also see that the hobbit was holding something important that appears to be falling. Let's zoom up on this so you can see it better. As you can see, the hobbit was holding a goblet of vitriol. Vitriol is sulfuric acid, so you can see that the goblet is appropriately labeled vitriol, and that the liquid falling out of the goblet looks kind of like acid. The hobbit was holding this goblet of vitriol because it's an enchanted goblet with special powers and makes him invisible. In any case, vitriol sounds like venereal, which is to help you remember the Venereal Disease Research Laboratory Test, or VDRL test. If we zoom back out, you can see that now we've added a tombstone on the ground next to the vitriol that says, Rest in Peace, or RIP. RIP is similar to RPR, which should help you remember the RPR test. Now you can see that we've added something else by the tombstone. Let's zoom up so you can see it better. As you can see, these are exposed bones surrounding a heart. The vitriol acid spilled on the ground melting it away and causing the burned corpse to be exposed. Now we can see the corpse's bones poking up out of the ground as well as its heart. Anyway, the bones are poking up out of the ground and are shaped kind of like phospholipids poking out of a cell membrane. So the bones oriented this way are here to help you think of lipids. The heart is here to make you think of cardio. So putting these two ideas together should help you remember that the non-treponemal serological tests, which includes the RPR and the VDRL tests, are positive when anti-cardiolipin antibodies are present. So bones shaped like lipids that surround a heart for anti-cardiolipin antibodies. All right, now let's talk about this archer character. As you can see, he's shooting an arrow right between the goblin's eyes. The arrow is kind of like an antibody because it's secreted from cells and sticks to pathogens, just like an arrow is shot from a bow and sticks to enemies. So the arrow is a symbol for an antibody, and the fact that the arrow is lit up with bright fire should make you think of fluorescence. So putting these two ideas together should help you remember the fluorescent treponemal antibody absorption test. If you have a hard time remembering which test is confirmatory and which is used as a screening test, just look at how the arrow is super precise and directly hitting the goblin right between the eyes. In other words, the FTA-ABS test is the confirmatory test. Okay, now that we've covered screening and diagnosing, let's move on to discuss secondary syphilis. Notice that we've added another hobbit to the scene. Let's zoom up so you can see him better. Hobbits tend to walk around barefooted, so we've shown this hobbit not wearing any shoes. As a result, their feet get pretty gnarly with lots of bumps and sores on them. So if you look at this hobbit's feet, you can see that he has a lot of little red spots. He also has red spots on his hands and a special copper alloy in his armor that makes his trunk look red. All of those red spots involving the trunk, hands, and feet should help you remember that secondary syphilis may present with a maculopapular rash involving the trunk, palms, and soles. This is an image of the characteristic maculopapular rash on the trunk of a patient with secondary syphilis. This is an image of the rash involving the palms. Okay, now notice that we've added this soldier guy with a flail. If we zoom up, we can see that the lumpy flail kind of resembles a warty lesion. This is here to help you remember that secondary syphilis may present with a wart-like lesion on the genitals known as condyloma lata. This is an image of condyloma lata. As you can see, it's a warty lesion, and in this image, it's surrounding the female genitalia. The beaded net that the soldier is holding represents the lymphatic system, because the lymphatic system is a large network of lymph nodes that resemble beads on a net. So this is here to help you remember that secondary syphilis may present with lymphadenopathy. Now we've added a mangy monster to the image that appears to be missing patches of hair on its trunk. This is to help you remember that secondary syphilis 
may present with patchy hair loss. Okay, let's move on to discuss tertiary syphilis. As you can see, we've added this old grandpa-looking wizard who we'll call Ganondorf. We've been using grandmas to represent granulomas, so we decided to have a grandpa to represent a gamma, which is a unique type of granuloma seen in tertiary syphilis. So Ganondorf grandpa for gummas. This is an image of a gamma on the nose. As you can see, it's characterized by inflamed tissue which surrounds a firm necrotic center. These can present as cutaneous lesions, but may also be found internally, such as on the liver or brain. We've intentionally shown Ganondorf wearing a hat to help you think of the brain, which should help you remember that neurosyphilis is a common complication of tertiary syphilis. Neurosyphilis is a broad term that refers to invasion of the CNS, which may result in meningitis, meningovascular disease, or cause damage to the spinal cord. So the hat should make you think of neurosyphilis and that this can cause neurological abnormalities such as meningitis. Finally, you should know that while neurosyphilis typically occurs late in the disease, it's possible for neurosyphilis to occur at any stage. All right, you may have noticed that the columns suspending the third floor are cracked. The columns represent the dorsal columns. So the fact that they're damaged should help you remember that the dorsal columns may be damaged in tertiary syphilis. This is a condition known as tabes dorsalis, and this occurs because the nerves within the dorsal columns become demyelinated as the infection invades the central nervous system. So cracked columns for tertiary syphilis causes tabes dorsalis. This is an image of a cross-section of the spinal cord, which we've shown in our neurology videos. As you can see, the dorsal columns are the posterior aspects of the spinal cord right here and convey information responsible for proprioception and vibration. So a patient with tabes dorsalis may present with abnormal proprioception and vibration. You may have been wondering why the columns were cracked in the first place. Well, it's because there's this tree that has been growing into and eroding the stone. If you look closely at the tree, you can see that it's shaped kind of like the aorta. So this is here to help you remember that tertiary syphilis may cause aortitis, resulting in a tree barking appearance of the aorta. This is exactly what it sounds like. The aorta resembles tree bark when viewed grossly. Now you can see that we've added an angry creature on the third floor near Ganondorf. This creature has relentlessly been following the hobbits in an attempt to capture that precious goblet. If we zoom up on his face, you can see that he has pretty angry, beady-looking eyes. He's hyper-focused on that goblet, so even if you waved your hand in front of him, he probably wouldn't blink. I guess you could say he's completely obsessed with the goblet. Anyway, these angry, hyper-focused eyes should help you remember that tertiary syphilis may present with Argyll Robertson pupils. This is a term used to describe pupils that will accommodate or reduce in size when focused on a close object, but that will not reduce in size in the presence of bright light. So just think of this monster's eyes that are unfazed because he's so focused on the goblet. All right, now you can see that we've added another hobbit kneeling down right next to Ganondorf. It looks as if he was thrown to the ground by the wizard in an attempt to protect him. Now we can see Ganondorf fighting something off to the left, which I'll show in a second. In any case, the red swollen knees should help you remember that tertiary syphilis may present with neuropathic arthropathy, which is also known as Charcot joint. This is a condition characterized by decreased sensation to the joint due to neuropathy, which over time results in damage to the joint. I know, I know, the red knees have represented septic arthritis in the past, but the fact that this hobbit is right next to Ganondorf, who represents neurosyphilis, should help you remember that this is a neurological-related joint problem. So hobbit with red knees next to Ganondorf for tertiary syphilis may present with neuropathic arthropathy. All right, now you can finally see who Ganondorf is fighting. It's this big monster from the underworld known as the Belrock. As I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, everything around this area of the image will represent information about congenital syphilis. To help you remember that this is congenital syphilis, we've shown a baby Belrog right next to the big mama Belrog. If we zoom up on these two monsters, you can see that they have notched appearing teeth. This is to help you remember that congenital syphilis may cause notched teeth. This is an image of notched teeth. As you can see, the central incisors right here have little indentations in them, and these are known as notched teeth. Another dental abnormality caused by congenital syphilis is known as mulberry molars, which are abnormally developed molars. So just think of the Belrog with abnormal teeth, for congenital syphilis causes abnormal teeth. Next, notice that they have large, intricate horns covering their ears. This is to help you remember that congenital syphilis may cause hearing loss. Also notice that they have odd-shaped noses. This is to help you remember that congenital syphilis may cause a nasal deformity, known as a saddle nose. This is an image of a saddle nose. As you can see, there's an indentation in this patient's nose right here. The Belrogs also have fire coming out of their mouth, nose, and head, and all of this fiery discharge should help you remember that congenital syphilis may cause snuffles, which is nasal discharge laden with trepanema pallidum. 
The Belrog also has a wide opening on the side of her mouth, which is to help you remember that congenital syphilis may cause her gates. This is characterized by wrinkled skin and linear scars at the angle of the patient's mouth. This is an image of Regades. As you can see, this patient has wrinkled skin from scarring around the mouth right here. Finally, look at the baby Belrog's legs. They're clearly deformed, and this is to help you remember that congenital syphilis may cause a leg deformity known as saber shins. All right, as you can see, Ganondorf is casting a spell on these monsters and attempting to destroy them with pennies. Pennies are our symbol for penicillin, so this should help you remember that congenital syphilis can be prevented if the mother is treated with penicillin early during pregnancy. This is possible because placental transmission usually occurs after the first trimester. Aside from this, you should know that penicillin is the treatment for syphilis in general. So just think of the penny magic spell, as well as the hammer plated with pennies, and these should help you remember that the treatment for syphilis is penicillin. All right, now that we've covered the image, let's review with a question. A 23-year-old male comes to the physician due to a small, painless lesion on his penis that he noticed yesterday. He is concerned he may have a sexually transmitted infection because four days ago, he had unprotected sexual intercourse with a prostitute. Physical examination reveals a painless ulcer on the shaft of the penis. A serum venereal disease research laboratory test is negative. Which of the following should be performed to make an accurate diagnosis of this patient's condition? A. The rapid plasma reagent test. B. Repeat the venereal disease research laboratory test. C. The toluidine red unheated serum test. Or D. The fluorescent treponemal antibody absorption test. Hopefully from the question stem you notice that this patient has a painless lesion on his penis, which is describing a chancre. A chancre is a clinical feature of primary syphilis. The VDRL was negative, which may have caused you to reconsider the diagnosis of syphilis. However, as we discussed earlier in this lecture, a negative screening test does not rule out the infection. Remember, it takes about four weeks to generate a robust immune response, so false negatives are very common early during the course of infection. So with this in mind, the correct answer is D, the fluorescent treponemal antibody absorption test. A, B, and C are all non-treponemal tests, so they're all based upon the detection of anti-cardiolipin antibodies. Because this patient already had the VDRL, it would be pointless to perform any of these tests which are based upon the same mechanism. The only treponemal test or confirmatory test is the FTA ABS test. So the correct answer is D. From the image, recall that the hobbit falling with the vitriol goblet right here represents the VDRL test. And the rest in peace sign right here represents the RPR test. Both of these are non-treponemal screening tests, and either can be used as the initial test for syphilis. The archer hitting the goblin between the eyes with a fire arrow right here should help you remember that the screening test should be followed by a confirmatory test, which is the fluorescent treponemal antibody absorption test. So remember, always perform a non-treponemal test followed by a treponemal test, which means the only correct answer here is D. And with that, we've covered everything you need to know about syphilis.